Ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests, thank you all for coming along tonight. Uh, it promises to be most inspiring. I'll explain why a little later. Look, this for me actually started uh, late last year. It was the Christmas drinks for UTS downstairs and uh, Mary Ann and Glenn cornered me and said, you've got to get into pie day. Now, I'm a paleontologist, so I instantly thought of food. But no, of course, it's nothing to do with pies, although today I did manage to drag most of the Catalyst crew down to the local pie shop to have a pie for lunch to celebrate Pie Day. What it is, is a celebration of the beauty and the ecstasy of pure mathematics, the limits of human intelligence and endeavour. And as we might more readily celebrate the beauty of artwork or sculpture or music, the achievements in mathematics have an, equal beauty, uh, have an equal beauty, and we don't get to, to appreciate that anywhere near as much as we do the more aesthetic arts. It was pointed out to me today that we can actually have two pie days each year, that the 22nd of the 7th in July is also pie, and in fact is a more accurate description of pie than the 14th of the 3rd, which only occurs in the United States. Because like just about everything else in that beloved country, it's all asked backwards and they have the month first and followed by the date. So we are here to celebrate the beauty and the ecstasy of pure mathematics. And also, this is for rationalists like myself, the perfect opportunity to be completely irrational for a day. We have the perfect excuse. It is an irrational number. And it's a way, of, as I said, of reaching out to ordinary people and getting them inspired by the beauty of mathematics. And there was a wonderful example of this this morning. John was on radio with Adam Spencer this morning, answering talkback calls about pi. How often do you get, well, with Adam Spencer, it's a little too often, but how often do you get mathematics brought to the fore uh, like that? And there was a question that absolutely floored me by its simplicity and the elegance of its answer. And that was, one caller said, can you use pi for anything other than circles? And the answer is yes. And I'm going to get John to provide the answer because it was a little bit above me, like most things that have passed between John and I in the last 24 hours. Completely fascinating. But when you're a paleontologist, way above your head. Um, let's get the ball rolling. Jonathan Borwain uh, is the Laureate Professor and Director of, the, of Karma at the University of, of Newcastle. Karma looks and sounds like an acronym that they then went and backfilled with uh, uh, some words to make it stick. Uh, it does actually stand for the Computer Assisted Research Mathematics and its Applications. Centre. Centre for Computer. Oh, that, then it should be two Cs. Yeah, <laughs> Kakama. Uh, but John does proudly say that the, the, the greatest benefit of that acronym is he's able to say, what brought you to Australia? Karma. His interests span pure applied and computational mathematics uh, and high performance computing. He was born in St Andrews in Scotland. He spent a lot of time in Canada. He has dual citizenship between Canada and, and Britain. Uh, he's also worked at Carnegie Mellon, uh, Dalhousie, Simon Fraser and Waterloo Universities. He is an expert on Pi. And last night, as I said, we, uh, we were having dinner and I was absolutely flabbergasted and inspired. There, there are two words that, that describe it as, as accurately as I can. There were phrases being thrown around that made no sense. <laughs> At one point, I actually got my wife to send an email to me on her iPhone so I'd remember this, because there's no way I would be able to remember it without such assistance. At one point, John leant across the table to Mary Ann and said, how did you not get swamped with exponential exposure? Now, I'm a paleontologist. I understand every word in that sentence, but I've got no idea what it means when you put them all together like that. <laughs> um, but something that really did come through last night is the definition of true genius. 
It's not what you know, it's how generous you are with the way that you share it with others. And last night, and at the moment, we are in the, uh, the presence of a true genius. To tell you everything you've ever wanted to know about dividing the circumference by the radius, would you please welcome to the stage, Jonathan Borlain. I, I'd just like to sit and hear more nice things told about myself. Can I go and sit down again? Thank you to everyone. I, there have been a lot of thank yous made. I would like just to say, specifically, I'd also like to thank ABC. Uh, the connection with IBM will be obvious as we go on. And Marianne Williams. I've known her for 25 years. And this is the first time I've ever spoken at, U, at UTS with her and for her. So that's a treat, too. Um, one of the great pleasures about speaking about Pi is that you can have an audience of people of age 8 to 88 with backgrounds from nuclear physics to English, and hopefully everyone gets something out of the talk. Uh, certainly what Paul said, or at least Glenn, I believe, was he used the word fun. Now, fun doesn't have to mean getting blind drunk in King's Cross. It can. <laughs> and fun used by an academic. In fact, I have an old friend here. Frank Clark, he's a man of deep thoughts and few words, and he'd been working with me sitting over there in Dalhousie 20 years ago. He looked at my board for 10 minutes without saying anything. He stroked his beard and said, this is fun. <laughs> so I hope we have some fun tonight. Um, the talk is divided, and it's named intentionally after the novel, soon to be a book, Life of Pi, which came out about 10 years ago. And Pi has a life, you know, it also starts with childhood, I'll even show you roughly the birth. Uh, adolescence, adulthood, and I didn't want to do senescence or golden years, so the second half of the talk is the talk I'll concentrate on. Uh, I have a strong uh, belief that I follow Lawrence Bragg's advice about talks. That is, to read your talk is like asking somebody to go for a walk with you and then saying, you're going to go along in your car and yell out the window at them. So the slides are background. If you want to think of them as sidebars, extra comments, if you don't want the sound of my voice, tune out and read. I will say some things on some pages and no things on other pages. The whole talk, which is longer than what I want to talk about, will be on the web tonight. The uh, picture at the left is a wonderful song by Kate Bush called Pi. The picture at the right will start a 3.14 minute video on Pi that we made for MSNBC, and they cut it to 3.14 minutes. We didn't think of it. <laughs> so what do I want to tell you? Um, I want to tell you, is, is my voice carrying? Yeah. Fantastic. I prefer not to have to stand right there. I, I'm going to tell you briefly about Pi before the digital age. And then I'm going to concentrate on Pi in the digital age. And I hope I've left enough links and extra pieces of story. There's some part and this is you, or you want to know more, it's there, or you can follow up. So let's get started. Uh, this is uh, thanks to modern LaTeX based talks. Each one of these is a live link, so if you're banging around through the talk, you want to go back and forth, you'll find it easy. Pi is everywhere. At first, we needed to be able to compute Pi for purely practical reasons, but Generously, that stopped 200 years ago. And I'll come back to that. But particularly since 1948, Pi has had a wonderful history, much of it until 1980, and now again tonight with IBM. Of being used as a grand challenge problem or a benchmarking problem uh, on computers. And that's partially, that's really the story I'm going to concentrate on. But to tell you that story without telling you what Pi is and where it came from would be kind of like showing you the punchline and not telling you the joke. Uh, and I don't mean to say this is all frivolous, but Pi has, has also, unlike any other part of mathematics, it's pervasive in popular culture. You cannot imagine a book called Life of Log 2. <laughs> hey, maybe I'll write. Um, and so I'm going to interspersed a largely chronological account of Pi's doing with uh, examples of its ubiquity, and if nothing else, they should be fun. And since I started doing this, here's, a, here's a kind of something to those of you who are still in school uniforms. It's much easier to keep doing something than start it. 
So for example, I started collecting fun things about Pi when they came out in newspapers 20 years ago and things were first really available on the internet. So I've got a fantastic collection. You say, how could he have that all? Well, somebody sent, Marianne sent me a Pi pizza cutter. So I put it in my collection. Really easy to keep going, not so easy to start. So what are we going to see? We're going to see a lot of stuff. And these are the punchlines, because I'm sure I won't get to them at the end. The main punchline is this lovely cartoon by Larson of two gnomes going down, and the caption is, because it's not there. Okay. So I could teach a serious, complete undergraduate curriculum in mathematics about pi without having to spin it. I could bring everything I needed to teach you about modern algebra, analysis, number theory, probability, and all the other stuff I haven't mentioned, and I could keep on, on topic. I could also tell you a bunch of just strange stuff, and that's part of what I'll do tonight. So one of the, the things that there's a small cottage industry in is mnemonics for pi. And they're very simple codes, where word length is a digit. So now 3, I, 1, even 4, I, 1, would celebrate 5, 9. That's the first six digits of pi. In rhymes in Nap the Great, that's five more digits of pi, and it goes on. And this isn't bad. I would give this a 3 out of 5 as a meme for pi. Maybe that's called a peme or something. Uh, because it's sort of about pi. It's sort of a poem. And if you memorized it, you would know 30 odd digits of pi. Okay? This cartoon I like better, it says, the old elephant saying to the younger one, when you're young, it comes naturally. When you're older, you have to rely on mnemonics. Okay, so the reason I called it Life of Pi is in the novel Life of Pi, which is coming out next year as a 3D movie. I'm looking forward to seeing it because I love the, the book, and I cannot imagine how you film it, but if anyone can do it, it's the director. And he says at the beginning of the book, my name is Pissing Molitor Patel. Piscine, for those of you who don't come from Canada, is the French word for swimming pool. And he grew up in a small town in French India. Believe it or not, there is something called French India. Not very much of it. And since he went to a school where nobody else spoke French, they called him Pissing Patel. He didn't like that, so he went to a new school, and he introduced himself as Pi, and then to make sure what he, know, what he was saying, he told them what Pi was. Again, try to imagine a book where somebody writes down, hey, my name is E. Smith. E, as in the natural logarithm. It wouldn't happen in a book, would it? So, before 1706, pi was written as p, for perimeter. Before about 1600, people did math without symbols. So again, when you're studying math in school, sometimes when you have a hard time getting through an hour's lecture, your teacher, whether it's a school or university, should actually do you the service of saying, you know, between 9.30 and 10.25, we did 150 years of mathematical evolution. You wouldn't feel so dumb when you don't get it in the first 20 minutes. <laughs> but why didn't they tell you that? Because it's true. These are some of the great triumphs of humanity. The guy with SE motor who invented X and Y, that wasn't that easy. You know, there's an old saying that, um, not so, what's so good about Shakespeare, all he did was string a bunch of well-known sayings together. You read mathematics now in school, you get this feeling that, you know, I don't get it, but it seems easy, and you don't get told what the triumphs are. You can learn about that from Pi. So I brought out a source book with my colleagues in the late 90s. It's now in its third, going to go to its fourth edition. We'll be updating it, including with tonight's results next year. And the whole back is we've got to get all the IP rights. And that's a non-trivial thing. It's maybe a record, because we had to get copyright releases for 4,000 years of stuff. Maybe a record. Um, popular culture. I'm not going to say what's in each one of them. The Matrix. Every time I show it to you, say, can you think of another piece of math or physics that could play this role? Avogadro's number in The Matrix. Wouldn't happen. Pi the movie. Root 2 the movie. Wouldn't happen. This is my all-time favorite URL. 3.1.14159 to 100 places.com. A slightly more serious example of pi and popular culture, who has used Google Trends? Now, Google Trends is a fantastic site. It's now being used in collaboration with the Institute for Disease Control, 
because Google and then the Institute for Disease Control in Atlanta realized that people go to Google before they go to their doctor. So you can track, and this is not silly, this is really interesting, this is really the changing face of networks. You can tell when a flu epidemic or something worse is breaking out by going to Google Trends. Two or three days before the doctors will start reporting it, to, if it's a reportable disease in their part of the country or the state. Fantastic. So what do I done here? I can't do it for Pi Day yet because tomorrow is Pi Day in America. And I'm going to give a talk over the internet, access grid, to people in the west coast of the states tomorrow. And then I'll go and see on the 15th what Pi Day looks. And the spikes, they're all spikes that came from previous Pi Days. The traffic in Pi is a fantastic time series. Very cool. Now, in 1989, Pi Day was a gag at a place called the Exploratorium. Who's heard of the Exploratorium? It's a fantastic hands-on museum in San Francisco, really the first of its kind. I could tell a whole lecture about it because it was started by Robert Oppenheimer's brother. Who's heard of Robert Oppenheimer? The man who did the Manhattan Project. His brother was the real lefty in the family. And he had to leave the country for 10 years. And only just got in later. While in Europe, he discovered the idea of a hands-on museum. So you can thank McCarthy for the exploratory. By 2003, Pi Day was such a success in North America that the head of IT at my university, he was a good guy, and he's on Apple's educational board, he phoned me and said, I'm going to have to shut you down. You're bringing down a university of 30,000. Because we have an applet that will recite Pi fast in about 25 languages. And it knows four million digits, so it doesn't get tired. And so we discovered there were hundreds of schools in North America, and the web in, 19, in 2003 didn't have the wits it has now. We were a serious bottleneck. Um, Pi Day turns up in a crossword. One of the clues was March 14th to mathematicians. That's a much younger version of me, my brother, and Simon Plouffe, and that's the puzzle. I had to pay $100 to the to the New York Times permission to print it. But if you look at various of the clues, you will see things in it. But if you go to the next page, this is what the cool part is, you should see about a dozen pies. And you have to read this as upping. Pi not. Pi is a two-letter symbol, so happier has one less letter than you thought, because you spell pi with a magnum pi. Okay. Another note, which I only noticed recently, look at the puzzle number. And Will Shorter is the puzzle guy, Will Shorts rather, on National Public Radio, so none of this was by chance. 20 years ago, my unindicted co-conspirator, Dave Bailey, in day life, he's a, one of the world's real experts on parallel computation for computational as opposed to computing science. Engineers and physicists compute. Computer scientists talk about it. Sorry, man. <laughs> and what you see, they asked for the 40,000 digit of pi. 20 years later, you would Google 40,000 digit of pi. You'd have it in a minute. David went and sent it to them. It came up in the show. I can recite pi to 40,000 digits, mm, pi. Now, two years ago, two days before Pi Day, pi was legislated by Congress into National Pi Day. So from a joke 20 years ago, to National Pi Day, and if you want to see the bill, you can easily Google it. I wanted to show you that the guy who got this passed was a 26-year congressman from Tennessee, and for the last five years of his congressional life, he was the chairman of the House Committee on Science and Technology. One thing about Google, I knew I knew the name. I couldn't remember exactly what he did. This really adds to the story, doesn't it? One of the things he did before, while well, he had the chance. Now, I say this was the first successful law on Pi, because in 1897, Indiana Bill 246 was fortunately shelved. It was an attempt to legislate the value, and I put values of pi, because it's such complete gibberish that you can work out at least six values that might be meant in the bill. And the closest is about four. But the man who, you know, was a pie nut, and he persuaded the Committee on Canals, which has been nicknamed the Committee on Swamps, that if they passed this bill, they could charge royalties. And luckily, a Professor Waldo, from, a mathematician from Purdue, turned up, and I imagine the conversation, well, Professor, you probably think we don't do nothing mathematical here. 
But we got this bill in the Committee on Swamps. <laughs> and he looked at it in Terry's hands and managed to get him to stop it. Now, we wanted to put this in our source book. So I wrote to the Congressional Librarian in Indiana. And between the time we'd seen it in an article and the time he requested it, some bugger had stolen pages three and four. So it only exists in facsimile. Okay. And last year, you see all that's right and wrong about Pi Day. Very cute, but definitely a geek. If you were in North America, not, not Australia on Pi Day, that was Google's login. Pretty much all the basic formulas about Pi, you can go back and look at them for 24 hours. Okay. Well, by now you get the idea, Pi is pretty much everywhere. And the three most recent, or two most recent record calculations, before the ones I'll tell you about today, were to compute five trillion, that's five followed by 12 zeros, digits of pi, last year by a Japanese hardware computer guy who built his own $18,000 computer, and a guy, a kid, who was then an undergraduate at Northeastern, is now a graduate student at Northwestern. And it's an amazing computation. A little bit after that, or before that actually, the two quadrillionth digits of pi in binary were computed without knowing the previous ones by folks at Yahoo Cloud Computing. And uh, I'll try and explain to you as we go now why they're amazing calculations. Here are the links. Everything's live. And again, I do want to thank ABC for the role they played. Very quickly about the childhood of pi. Um, the Babylonians knew pi probably as well as 3 and an 8, that's 3.125, so call it 3.1, one digit correct. The, Greek, the Egyptians had about the same error. They both needed to have some estimate of how big the circle was, because you can't do astronomy without rotations. You can't work out when the eclipses are coming in. People who could predict eclipses were seriously powerful, because these were scary and magical events before they could be predicted. And as other, as um, has been said by obviously Clark, any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. When you know something and they don't, you have magic. But the Greek, and I want to make this point really clear, pi is the only piece of mathematics that goes back this far that's still the subject of serious research. Now, somebody's almost about to be able to call me wrong, but I'll say morally I'm right. Um, there are other pieces, quite fun about Maimonides, known as the Rambam, who seems to have written a thousand years ago that pi is transcendental, does not solve an algebraic equation. Remember, the difficulty of reading mathematics from before about 1700 is it was written in words. Words that started maybe in Aramaic, moved into Greek, translated into Latin, and you don't know who to blame. That's the way Jews got horns. Bad translation between Aramaic and Greek. And, and that, let me tell you, as a non-believing Jew, has not been a happy story. Um, but the story really starts with Archimedes. And he did two things. Did they tell you there are two pies? There's nothing elementary that lets you see that the pi in the area formula and the pi in the perimeter formula are the same thing. It's clear that the, vo the area will grow like the square and the perimeter will grow linearly, at least it's clear once you've done a little geometry, but it's by no means clear that they're the same number. Who proved they were? This is essentially Archimedes' proof. Another point I wanted to make is, here are 200 digits of pi. That's enough to compute the volume of a known spherical universe with an error of less than a hydrogen nucleus. That's a fairly good level of accuracy. So if you say, for physical reasons, do you need more digits? No. But I also wanted to show you how amazing Archimedes' method really is. What he did was what you've probably seen. Who's seen a picture like this for computing pi? Okay, well, what he did was, say, put a green hexagon inside a circle. It's called an inscribed hexagon. Put a blue one around the circle. It's called a circumscribed hexagon. And you'll be able to work out uh, with a little bit of thinking in geometry, what the length of the inside hexagon and the outside one is. And then what Archimedes said to himself is he persuaded himself that the length of the circle must be in between. Is that obvious? The length of the circle must be bigger than the inside one. That's because it doesn't wiggle. I could make a length I wanted 
if I wobbled it up and down. So it's not as obvious as it looks. It's because you think convex. Then he said, what happens if I double it? 6 goes to 12. 24, 48, 96. I only drew two steps because this is 12. It's pretty obvious already that they're getting really close to circles, isn't it? So that's an inscribed green uh, 12 agon and an outside green duodecagon. And I didn't draw the next one because it just looked like a circle to the pixel level you have on a projector. But what Archimedes did was work out how to do this only knowing these two lengths. He didn't try and do trigonometry, he couldn't. It wasn't invented for another 16 or 1800 years. And he then carefully rounded up the upper answers, rounded down the lower answers and did it one, two, three, four times, and that gave him that estimate. So in doing that, he invented numerical analysis. He invented interval analysis, which was really not done as again properly until the 20th century. And one of the problems with not knowing how things fit in is I've had eminent physicists and mathematical friends saying, oh, it was just number crunching. That's the last thing it was. It's one of the most brilliant general pieces of mathematics. Again, because mathematics exists as a human science, I wanted to show you where Archimedes lived. He lived in one, at the boot, as they call it, of, of Italy in Sicily. And I've drawn two, three, four, five, six, and seven. Those are four of the wonders, as they're called, of the ancient world. Only one of them is in what you think of as Greece, Athens. Archimedes in his life, maybe the most famous Greek scientist, never left Sicily. The Mafia wouldn't let him. Okay. And let me go back, because I'm going to do the first thing that I've said. I have some skips. So there's some marvelous material for following up on, but I've skipped it. So what happens? There's a thing in science called that Thomas Kuhn talked about. He talked about paradigm shifts. It's now a massively overused term. But in all sciences, there are paradigm shifts where somebody has a radically different way of thinking about things. And then it reverts to what's called normal science. So the paradigm shift was Archimedes' idea that you could actually mathematically compute pi. The normal science was, gee, let's do more of it. And that went on for about 1,600 years. This is almost certainly independent in China, but it's very hard to tell. We are only now learning what sort of interactions went on between the Spice Islands and Australia. Uh, I am very skeptical that there was quite as many independent discoveries. It's become very popular in ethnomathematics to say the Mayans knew this and the Chinese knew this and the Indians knew this. It's certainly true it was there. It doesn't tell you how it got there. Just like bugs from space. Well, we can pick up little bits of meteors on Mars and discover they came from Earth. But you wouldn't think that when you pick them up. So be skeptical of people who tell you they know for sure what happened as opposed to they show you what they could see. But here's my favorite calculation of all time. 1429 in Samarkand on the Silk Road. That was the pipeline to money for a thousand years between China and Europe. It's where Marco, why Marco Polo went to China. It's at some level why, why the Khans came east. Samarkand is now in Uzbekistan, and it's quite fascinating to me to think that 600 years ago, maybe the best mathematician in the world lived in Samarkand. And this wonderful expression, he could calculate as eagles can fly. And this is a calculation that he wrote down in 1429. He wrote it down base 60. Six, so he didn't really have, he didn't have an FF for 59. But he did have a base 60, uh, and 60, very natural, 360 days, roughly in a year. We do it the same with time, we do 60. And this is it, and with, with some timidity, I, I coded it when I first found this, and to my great pleasure, it is correct to 16 digits. And it's just as correct now as it was then, or the other way around, it was just as correct then. But you have to imagine what was involved in doing it. He did not have an iPad, a Mac Plus, or even a hand calculator. Okay, so here's now where we'll start to speed up that part of the talk, because I'm aiming to get to that IBM logo. So over 2,000 years, no, I beg your pardon, 3,600 years, but what's, what's a millennia between friends? Paleontologists <laughs> included. <laughs> uh, Babylonians, Egyptians, Archimedes, we're up to three digits. Al-Kashi, who could calculate as eagles can fly, 
14 digits, and by the end of the Renaissance, we've got up to 35 digits. He computed 39 and got four wrong, which is one of the reasons we always do things separately. In, in Germany, pi is still often called the Ludolfian number, or Ludolf's number. It's really nice to engage you audience. I had a fantastic German student. He was in one of these talks, and I said, Armin, did you know you, you agree? He said, I never heard that. I said, go back to Germany. <laughs> so he was very proud of the fact that he computed pi. He also discovered the double angle formula for cosine. So he was a serious mathematician in the Leiden, which then and now is a great center of mathematics in Europe. And he um, wanted it on his tombstone, but about 200 years ago, the vandals stole the handle. The tombstone was stolen. The plans remained. And when Henry Leister, who's a brilliant computer scientist and mathematician, retired to Leiden, he and his wife, who's a professional photographer, arranged to have the tombstone rebuilt. So this is the rebuilt tombstone in the cathedral in Leiden, in the St. Peter Platz. And here you can see the, de the digits as fractions. Couldn't have decimals. Decimals weren't in Europe where you then. So this is an interesting representation of it. He thought of it as a fraction. Now, there was a talk like this attended by 750 people, including the doctoral family. And my brother gave one of the all-time weird math talks. From halfway up the pulpit, he gave a 20-minute talk about Ludolf. Can you imagine giving a talk about the Euler Mascaroni constant to the Queen of England? No. Well, we're getting the end of the childhood. My call is the fairly dark ages, because again, we've inherited so many bogus and inflated notions of there was good stuff, it was called the Greeks. Then there was sort of despotic stuff, it was called the Romans. And then there was the Dark Ages. And luckily then we had the Renaissance. And it, as the only thing, there's something sort of true about it. This is a man you've never heard of, Pope Sylvester, who was a radical and liberal monk called Gerbert, and he briefly became a Pope in the year 1000. After having almost been charged with heresy in the year 99, 999 because he was in favor of Arabic, uh, Indo-Arabic notation, and my wife and I were discussing what a great what-if novel. He died two years later, and given how many popes were killed, who knows how he died, but imagine if he'd stayed, like some popes have, on, as pope for 30 years. And imagine if he'd driven modernization of this kind to Europe, not after 1200 when Fibonacci first made it possible, and not after 1400 when it really became used in Europe, but 400 years earlier. How much might it have changed? And we're just talking about zero and decimals. Now, this is going to seem almost unbelievable. Every time I read it, it still does to me. In those days, arithmetic was really hard. And here's an advice from, from a, to a German businessman, from a scholar, about where to send his son to university. It says, if you only want to decode addition and subtraction, you can go anywhere. But if you want him to go on to multiplication and division, and read this carefully, assuming he has sufficient gifts, you'll have to send him to Italy. It's kind of hard to work that out. How could that be? Well, go and ask your teachers to let you build what Claude Shannon built in 1953, a calculator that calculates in Roman. He called it Throwback One. And you'll see that until a lot of mathematical advance comes from good notation. This is probably the best example. It makes things possible. The only thing I know in defense of Roman is it's seriously hard to fake a Roman check. <laughs> Can't add a zero, you've got to squeeze in an MMXIV. <laughs> so when Google made its share offering five years ago, this is how many shares it offered. And it's uh, that many shares. Pi minus three. So I don't know why they wanted that many pieces of pi, and they have these wonderful commitments, but I think they wanted that. They know something we don't know about pi, and they're evil. <laughs> pi is adolescence. Well, this is claimed to be the first infinite expression for anything in mathematics. And you take square root of two, you divide it by two, and you multiply it by square root of two plus root two over two, and you keep doing it. And you can see the pattern. You can try with your calculator, and you will get two over pi. And Vieta discovered this. And here is the corresponding, if you know what continuous fractions are, this is a very neat fraction by the first president of the Royal Society of London. Uh, and these are intended to be the first two infinite anythings. Now, this was based on something by John Wallace, perhaps the most famous British mathematician you've probably not heard of. Probably heard of Isaac Newton, yeah? Who's heard of Newton? Newton actually called Wallace our remarkable Wallace. 
Newton wasn't a nice man. He clapped while his mother's house burned down. So to say something nice about Wallace, Wallace must have had something on him. <laughs> so this is an amazing formula. And again, try it. 1 over 2 times 3 over 2 times 3 over 5 times 4 over 4. And you see the pattern? It happens to be 2 over pi. And that led to the discovery of an enormous amount of modern mathematics. Uh, when Christian Huygen, what's happened here? Oh, that's what happened here. When Christian Huygen, the physicist, optical astronomer, found he didn't believe it until he checked it numerically. He said, cool, he used his hand calculator. Just find out how slowly this converges and ask yourself how much work do you have to do to check it numerically? It's really quite interesting. And here's what I would believe to be a four out of five mnemonic for pi. It's a clue, an ever-repeating learning chain. This was published in the New Scientist last year for Pi Day. This one's worth remembering if you want to be able to recite pi and sound erudite. It's pretty good. Okay. And I'm going to skip this page because it's a math for the future. But I told you about the example of Vieta. And Descartes is famous for having invented Cartesian coordinates and allowing you to do geometry with numbers. But the other great predecessor here was Vieta, whose expression we saw. There were always Latin and French names or Italian names, so there's no real spelling. Spelling wasn't uniformized in any way till the late 18th century, anywhere in Europe. Um, arithmetic is as much science as geometry, and he has a wonderful quote. If someone measures magnitudes of numbers, and by his calculation gets them different from what they really are, it is not the reckoning's fault, but the reckoner's. There's a wonderful line in Waiting for Godot, the, the Beckett play, in which one of the characters is blamed, told to stop blaming the problems of his feet on his boots. This was radical. For 2,000 years, geometry had been the only way math was done. He also was the man who introduced literals, x and y for abstract quantities. Those were amazing advances. Final jeopardy. You can also actually win money with pi. So here was the final jeopardy category for pi in uh, five years ago. How I want to drink alcoholic, of course. 3.141592. Six. What is pi? Well, Ray, who was in third place, bet all his money and won. The other two had no idea and lost. <laughs> Ray would not have a chance today. Last month, uh, IBM introduced, in a public competition over three nights, a machine that walloped the two best Jeopardy players ever. Jeopardy is this question game where they give you answers and you work out the questions. And IBM said quite rightly that for Natural language querying, this was a much more interesting test of getting things done than most other things. And they, even a, this guy won 73 days in a row. And this guy won more money than he did. They got to set the topics. They tried to make them as ambiguous as possible. And it still won, well, routed is the only word I know for it. They thrashed the humans. And I think this is a very exciting, I've spoken to Glenn about it, I think it's an incredibly exciting thing if we look at adding another layer with the sort of stuff Mary Andrew group do, which lets us ask questions about specific scientific subjects. It's already, there's licensing going on with medicine, you can see how you might mine this for diagnosis and you name it, but I just want to do it for math. So we're now into Pi's adult life. I'm ashamed to tell you, you read the quote, I told you I wasn't going to read my slides. Anyone recognize that year? And don't tell me it's a thousand after 666 and that's something to do with the apocalypse. <laughs> Great Fire of London, anything else? And the play. So in the 17th century, Newton and his German counterpart, who may be more honestly given a role in the birth of computing than Newton was, both discovered calculus and there was an immediate priority battle. We tend to think these things are modern. You know, fighting in public and complaining, he stole my idea, she published my result. Machen, whose name we'll meet later, John Machen, adjudicated, and basically cleared them both. Uh, one of the very early uses comes from the fact that if you know a little calculus, the arctangent can be computed to be an indefinite integral of 1 over 1 plus t squared. If you know the geometric series, 1 over 1 plus t squared can be expanded as 1 minus t squared plus t to the fourth, etc. And if you've done any calculus, you think it's probably fair to interchange limit to an integral, sum an integral, and you integrate the first term, you get x, you integrate the second term, you get x cubed over 3, you will get this series. And this is now known as Leibniz, or the Gregory Leibniz 
Arkan series. And so the first thing you'll see, and it was certainly known to Madhava, a great astronomer and mathematician from the Kerala school in India, it was known at least uh, 200 years earlier. And he probably computed 30 digits of five digits. Now what you'll see in textbooks is, well, we could put in x equals one. Arctangent of one, that's the angle that has its sine equal to its cosine. So what is arctangent of one? Anyone want to risk community? Pi over four. So put in one, one minus a third plus a fifth, etc. Cool, we've got an infinite series of pi upon four. What they didn't tell you is, that series is only justified when x is less than one. It's actually not that easy to prove it's true when x is less than equal one. And I think it's actually disgraceful that every single high school and university calculus book tends to just ignore that. It's perfectly legal to say, proving this isn't that easy, it's true. That's honest. What they do is just bogus. However, you can prove it, and to be quite, just to show you a little more high-tech mathematics, the most effective way is to use Lebesgue's monotone convergence theorem for measure theory, which was one of the great achievements of 19th century and early 20th century analysis. It's a little after Leibniz. So naively done, this is completely useless, because the error, if I do that, the error is like 1 13th. If I add a 13th, the error is like 1 15th. So if I want to get six digits correct, I have to have a million turns. <coughs> If I want to get 12 digits correct, I have to have a billion terms. You can actually use clever modern ideas, divide and conquer, and you can actually compute pi that way. I've actually computed 5,000 digits of pi that way, just to show you can. But it's useless, and but what happened? Anyone recognize this name, Halley? Yeah, that's the same man as the comet. Uh, and he got a man called Adrian Sharp, who was his computer, and they used arctangent of a third. So if I go back with a third here, I've got things dropping down by a power of three every time. That's actually pretty efficient. It's a lot of work, and you have to do it by hand. But they managed to compute 100 digits that way, or close to 100. Euler found some very cool formula like, like this. These are now called Machen formulas, where you write one arctangent as a sum of two or three or four others. And the trick is to try and make one, which is a big number, into numbers close to zero, because that series I showed you will converge the, the, the binding feature is the largest term. So the smaller I can make this, the better things will work. And between 1700 and 1980, that was essentially the only way pi was ever computed, was variations of the C. That's what we call normal science. Yeah? Now, Machen, apart from keeping peace between Germany and England by saying both Leibniz and Newton were discoverers. He also taught Taylor of Taylor series. So you hear these names you've never heard of. They were really serious intellectual players in their, in their times. It was used including in a computation by a man called William Shanks. There's another guy called Daniel Shanks who did it 100 years later. And he made a mistake. He published 707 digits, but it was wrong after the 527th place. And the mistake wasn't discovered until 1945. I think that's a Guinness Book of Records for an uncovered, un uncovered numerical error. Is that part of the um, uh, Magnetic Project record? Pardon? Well, why 1945? That's because... Well, because Ferguson in that stage actually went back. It, it, no, it may have actually had a relationship. I can't tell you that, but he had an electronic calculator. He had, sorry, he had a hand crack calculator. So it was calculating cold. Now, Newton discovered something marvelous. After this, I may just sort of go into the computations, but I have to tell you what Newton did. He discovered a different formula. He said, I can work out the area of that red piece. I know the area of that blue piece, and if I know both, I know what proportion of a circle it is, so I know pi. He wrote down, he said, well, A is this integral. It's pretty weird. It's a sort of messed up inverse sine function. But remember, when you're inventing something, you don't do it right always the first time. He then took his new binomial theorem, so he said, just like we looked at the geometric series, you can do a fancier thing with halves, only he could do it. And he did it, and then he interchanged integral and summation again, and lo and behold, he, then he added back the blue part, that's three root three over four, and a few terms of this, not hundreds, let him get 15 digits of pi. And that's where he apologized for having no business at the time. And when I started reading about these things, and it's one of the articles we collected, in the book, it's a long chronology of everything done on pi until 1951. 
And my historian friend, Lake Berger, said, we should take it out, because it's inaccurate. I said, it's also historical. Hmm? You don't only just leave the stuff that was right, you leave a complete story. So he says, Newton never tried to compute pi with the suggestion that it was kind of below his pay scale. He did. We discovered that by looking through Newton's original works. Nothing will replace looking at the originals, and you guys can do that. Because nine-tenths of the stuff will be online in a good collection. Fantastic, particularly when Watson is there to help you. We're going to do the Watson cheat at school version. <laughs> now, as I said, you know not the business to do at the time. The fire of London ended the plague year. The fire, from that point of view, was a good thing. It also closed Cambridge. So Newton got sent back like other wealthier people to his country estate. The apple didn't fall on his head. But he did have a bunch of time to think. And he must have been extremely tired, because thinking that hard is actually tiring. Because the things he did in that year are flabbergasting. There's another year that's sometimes called Anonymous Mirabilis. Anyone want to suggest whose year it was? Einstein. Anyone know Einstein's birthday? Today. 314. Happy birthday, Albert. It's the other reason we should celebrate today. Uh, maybe the two most remarkable years in the history of intellectual thought. Newton in 1666, Einstein in 1905. Here's what we've done now in the last 20 minutes of this talk. Sharp, Mac, and the first hundred digits. We've got to three places, but with tens, not three digits. Shanks, with an error that I actually put the details about. It's kind of fun. Uh, he, does anyone know what it means to have published a book by subscription? Until mass marketing in the 20th century, most scientific volumes, Audubon, or in this case Shanks, would send notes around to the Royal Societies and learned societies are saying, would you pay 30 guineas, or whatever, for a copy of my small book that I will read out? So he gathered 30 subscriptions from people like De Morgan, uh, Herschel, the son of the astronomer Royal, really, uh, Airy, who if you're a physicist, you've certainly heard of, of Airy functions. It was like a who's who of British science, and they paid their money, and 30 copies were made. De Morgan bought two. And he looked at it and said, I don't believe it. There are too many sevens. <laughs> okay. 707 digits. They can be 0, 1, up to 9. So how many sevens do you expect? 71. Pardon? 71 or so. Yes. And if you saw 73, would you be upset? No. If you saw 90, would you be upset? Yes. Because we have no reason to believe that they're not well distributed, and there are way too many sevens. It took until Ferguson to prove that um, Shanks was wrong and De Morgan was right. And that's the other message. And don't leave your brain at the door. Do a sanity test. What used to be what well, is called in physics, do a Fermi test. You know, does it smell right? Do an order of magnitude. If, it's, if that's true, that's amazing. So I'm going to show you a calculation at the end that Andrew has just finished. Uh, with us, and it's a long binary strand, right? but it's in octal, and we, we've got it in base 8. It looks like rather than like what sort of numbers. I said, let's just change it to binary, because then it was 150 digits long. Sorry, about 180 digits long. And let's just see how many zeros and ones there were. So there's no reason to believe that God favors ones in base 2. There were 88 zeros and 92 ones. That's happier than if I saw 90 of each. I'd have thought Andrew reaped it. Yeah? If things are too normal like they were in Mendel's experiments with peas, did you know that, that Mendel's famous experiments had way too close to the right ratio? There's no suggestion that Mendel, the monk, who planted pink and white peas and then counted their descendants, was cheating, but people discovered that Brother Mendel really liked it when he had pink peas over there and white peas over there. So they helped. Same thing happened in 1920. Same thing happened in 1920 when the first attempt came to confirm Einstein's predictions, measuring the perihelion of Mercury. And it's almost certain now that a whole bunch of people fiddled their data till they got things that confirmed the experiment. You know, they had noisy data as they cleaned it. Science often advances by knowing things before it can show it, and there's a very delicate balance between cheating and putting the best light on something. So that was very important. <laughs> no, I mean, seriously, when, you, when, when is knowledge inside a trading? Well, it's definitely true to get caught. 
So that then in 1949, two very distinguished computer scientists, Wright, Weisner, and Metropolis, both of whom died quite recently, under the aegis of John von Neumann, who's viewed as the last true polymath, physics, astronomy, computing, logic, meteorology, you name it. He said, guys, why don't you see if pi looks normal? Look, can you compute a few did, can you compute 2,000 digits of pi for me? And they did. This is the machine, or at least the class of machines they did it on. Uh, well, by, by what, which I mean, they did this on. Because all these computations were done on IBMs. And you notice as the years go by, we go from something that looks like pre-computer to now when the records are made, they go up by an order of magnitude. And the times typically go down. Um, and let me skip again. This is, by the way, I, I can't skip it because I was promised <laughs> that I would explain it. I also used to use my first laptops, well, POC, I mean, that's bloodable computers. That's what they used to call the Apple. They were honest enough to say it wasn't portable. They would call it luggable, which means I brought it to Australia. Um, I would do the same thing. And here's the description of what was said lucid. I think it was by, by you with raindrops. But think about it with rice or sand. You can do this with salt at home. Draw this, sprinkle salt in it, you put enough salt in it, and cut this out so the salt here falls through. Put a pound of salt there and then weigh the salt that's left on the scale. You should have pi upon four. If you put in a pound of salt to begin it with, you should have 0.7 blah 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 pounds of pi of salt. That's a multicolor simulation. Like, uh, uh, like Glenn, I discovered that it was impossible to use to compute pi, but it was a great way to see how utterly awful the random number generators, and IBM had a famous error from that time. Its random number generator had a pattern mod 3. Every third term was related to one three ago. So it sounds simple. You say, pick random numbers from a computer. They better be something like random. If we could prove that pi's digits were random, we could basically take away random number generators and just randomly, in some sense, pick a digit of pi, take 100 digits, and use it for encryption. I think it would be perfectly safe, and I'm a little surprised nobody's done it. But anyhow, so let's go on from that back into uh, our talk with a skip. So now we're into the digital period. So we're up to a million digits of pi in 1973 and 100,000 in 1969. I didn't want to go that far. So let's go back to pi in the digital age. Now, until 1950, a computer was a human being. In 1950, roughly, a computer became a machine. Before that, the machine was a calculator, and the human being was a computer. After that, the human was a calculator, <laughs> and the machine was a computer. Two things happened. Commercial computers, starting with the machine that the developers of the ENIAC first built, which I'll tell you a little about the history of, it was a fantastic part of intellectual and property rights history. And then in 1965, two things were invented. The fast Fourier transform, which is arguably the most used algorithm in modern com scientific computation. Everything from looking for oil resources to reconstructing your spleen. I mean pictures of your spleen. I haven't quite got to being able to reconstruct your spleen with it. Um, and it turned out to be amazing for doing multiplication. And that's one of the really wonderful messages that I won't tell in any detail. But except for addition, if you want to multiply long numbers together, or divide one from another, or do anything else in mathematics, the way you were taught in school sucks. They taught you to do addition right. That's about it. <laughs> and if you want to know more about that, you can do really amazing things with multiplication, and then you can use Newton's method cleverly to make a division no more expensive than four multiplications of that length, and a square root no more expensive than seven multiplications of that length. So we, this is what mathematicians do, they abstract. And I'll come back to that. But until the 80s, everybody used math and formulas. And luckily, in 1965, the other most consequential event development time, actually there were three that took place within about a year, and I'll leave you to think what the third one was, magnetic resonancing was invented. And it's transformed medical and other treatment. It's even used to discover when the Italians are faking their olive oil. Because you can tell which orchard things didn't come from. If that had been discovered about this, it would have been useless. If this had been discovered about that, nobody would have cared. 
That's how science progresses. The third, anyone want to see us what the third breakthrough was with the same year or two? Fiber optics. I heard a wonderful talk about 30 years ago by a scientist called Gomery from IBM, who was uniquely at different times a vice president of research and a vice president of finance. That's pretty serious. Yeah? And he talked in 1990, and he was about 65 at the time, he said the only surprise of the previous 40 years had been fiber optics. Everything else was stuck in the development lab. And this was a gift from the gods that gave you three orders of magnitude more of everything that you couldn't have predicted. So the reason we have the internet, the reason we have almost all of modern stuff, is a mixture of these three things. And again, that never gets told. These are triumphs of engineering, but before they were triumphs of engineering, they were triumphs of scientific creativity. Okay. And uh, let's skip that too. We're into pie in the digital age. This is a picture of the Indian genius Ramanujan, Srinivasa. Didn't get to live very long, 1887 to 1920. And only in the last 30 years has his work been fully worked out. Amazing story, but it's another full lecture or two. But I happen to have this stamp in my album at home, now belongs to my daughter. They, some nice Indian who my father did not know, sent the first day cover from India, that's his 75th birthday, the 22nd of December, and they morphed my home address, 10 West Acres, to the University of St. Andrews. I can tell you our house was not that big. <laughs> the University of St. Andrews did not fit into 10 West Acres. The five of us barely fit in. Um, one of the formulas in this is the extraordinary formula 12. And now that's another point I want to make is learn to read mathematics. So you might look at it and say, oh, 